Hello, everyone. Hello. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you guys about the body of Christ. I don't really have an introduction for it or anything, so we're just going to go right into it. So, today we're going to talk about someone named Joseph. And yeah, I know you know Joseph. But this Joseph is the Joseph of Arimathea. Okay, he was a person in the Bible who took care of the body of Christ who loves Jesus, who was a disciple of Jesus. 
It's an interesting story, and it's only four verses long. So we're going to read it together, see what we can learn from it, and apply it to our own lives. But before I start reading, let me pray for us. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for the Sunday that we get to gather here to worship you, and thank you for the space for that. God, I pray that as we listen to your word, we may learn more about you, apply your word to our lives, and help us to grow in our faith. And God, I just pray for receptive hearts, open ears to listen, and Lord, um, would you move today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let me read this for us. And just a heads up, this takes place right after Jesus was crucified. So he died already, and the title of the passage in the Bible actually says, The Burial of Jesus. So this is what we're going to read. So Matthew chapter 27 says, As the evening approached, there came a rich man from Arabia named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had put out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. So, we're going to look at Joseph. Joseph did something significant and special that I'm going to bring him to us. Four things. So, basically, with this passage that we read, he got Jesus' body from Pilate, wrapped his body up, placed it inside of the tomb. But there are some things that we can learn that he did. Um, especially learning from his love for Jesus and his body. So let's go through them real quick. First, Joseph used what he had to take care of Jesus' body. Because the Bible tells us that Joseph was a rich man. Now, in the other Gospels, Mark, Luke, and John, it tells us that he was part of the council, basically this form of leadership. So he was a man of authority, a man of influence. And he used what he had to go to Pilate and get Jesus' body. Because Pilate was the governor. He was like, Powerful, you can't just have random ordinary citizens go to Pilate and ask for things. So Joseph saw what he had when he was capable and used his influence, used his power to get to Jesus' body. And that's significant because he didn't just sit back, waste what he had, or let other people do the job. He saw the opportunity, saw what he was capable of, and did it. So that's the first point. Second is Joseph went in the evening, no attention from crowds of people. He didn't let anyone see what he was doing. He did it in complete secret. He didn't go around telling people like, oh, I'm going to use my rich, I'm going to use my influence to get Jesus' body. He didn't brag to the other believers what he was about to do. He went in the evening. He went alone. No one was applauding. He had no disciples telling him to thank you, thank you. And Jesus wasn't even there to thank him because Jesus was dead. And God didn't open up heavens to say thank you, Joseph. It was nothing, silence, no recognition, but he got the job done. And we can learn about his humility and how he loved Jesus, even though he had no one to see it. Third point, Joseph loved Jesus' body, even though it was lifeless, because Jesus died. The former glory of Jesus, all his healing, miracles, power, were all gone when Jesus died. Because when Jesus was alive, you know, you could touch his clothes and you could get healed. His hands could heal diseases, his voice could cast out demons, drive out evil spirits. All of that was beautiful. Crowds followed him, people sang songs about him. But when Jesus died, all that was gone. If he touched his body, he couldn't get healed. His voice was still, silent, dead, and cast out any demons, nothing. There was no glory on his body. His body was torn apart and bruised. Where were the crowds of people then? You know, the blind people who could see the lepers who were healed. They're all gone. But here we see Joseph, who still chose to love Jesus, even though Jesus' body couldn't offer him anything. The Bible never said that Jesus healed Joseph of any crazy diseases. The Bible never even really talked about any encounter Joseph had with Jesus. But here we see this is the man, this is the person who chose to love Jesus' body, take care of Jesus' body, even though he couldn't offer him anything. Whereas all the people who got healed, all the crowds of people were gone, he remains. And that is significant. And my last and final point is this. Joseph prepared Jesus' body for a resurrection. You know, he got Jesus' body from Pilate, wrapped it in a cloth, and placed it inside of a tomb. And that's significant because imagine if Jesus' body was just tossed outside of the city because he was crucified as a criminal. The Roman soldiers just threw out his body. 
animals would have gotten into Jesus' body, tore it apart, taken it away, and there would be no resurrection. That's why what he did was so significant. He chose to wrap it up, place it inside of a tomb by preparing it for his resurrection. And the crazy thing is, Joseph had no idea that Jesus was going to rise again. He was just trying to do the right thing, you know, wrapping his body up, placing it inside of a tomb. He had no idea that he was preparing it and setting it up for a resurrection. So that's why what he did was so significant. So let me go over the four points and review them real quick. So first, Joseph used what he had to take care of Jesus' body, you know, his power, his influence to kill the pilot and get his body. Two, Joseph went in the evening. He got no attention from crowds. He didn't seek any attention from people. He was just loving Jesus' body in humility and love. Number three, Joseph loved Jesus' body even though it was lifeless. Love Jesus' body even though he couldn't offer him anything in return. And last but not least, Joseph prepared Jesus' body for a resurrection, getting his body from Pilate, wrapping it up, and placing it inside of the tomb. So, yeah, these are four points that make Joseph a significant person in the Bible. And I hope we can all learn from that and apply it to our lives. And yeah, that's it for today. I'm um, wishing you guys, you know, just kidding. The wish. The plot twist. <laughs> I just got started. All this time, I've been talking about the physical body of Jesus. But the Bible also tells us that there is a spiritual being to the body of Christ, Jesus' body. And that is the church. Us. We are the body of Christ. We are Jesus' body and the people who make up the church. So right now, we're going to go through those four points again. But this time, instead of talking about and relating it to Jesus' physical body, I'm going to relate it to us, the church, as being the body of Christ. Let's go through them. First, Joseph used what he had to take care of Jesus' body. We also need to use what we have to take care of Jesus' body, the body of Christ, the church. Some of us know musical instruments. You can read music on a sheet. Or maybe you're a great organizer or a great coordinator. Use that for God's glory. For example, I recently found that I was pretty good at logistics and coordination. As in, like, I can make things happen. Some people come up with ideas, have a lot of different thoughts, but they can't put it into action. But I feel like God has given me that great when someone tells me a plan, an idea, I see the order and steps on how to execute that plan. It just comes naturally. I know who to contact, I know which order to start with, what steps, and then make the event happen. So that's something God has gifted me with. But who knows, maybe you're great at generating ideas, but maybe you struggle with putting it into action. So all of us are gifted with different things. So imagine if we all work together, use what we have. Imagine what we can do in the body of Christ, this church, and this ministry. Another example, if you have artistic talent, we need a lot of help with that. For the month of May, last month, or this month, Iris was the one who created the speaker flyers. She was the one who put up the picture, put up the design, and posted on social media. It was her. So you get the idea, you get to use what you have to take care of the body of Christ. But I realized that some of us might not know what we're good at with what we have, and that's normal. I didn't know for the longest time until I discovered what God has given me and what he hasn't. Because it's true, God doesn't give, hasn't given me some stuff, but he has given other people some stuff. That's normal. So I'm going to go through five things with you all that we all have. That you have, that I have, that we can all use for the body of Christ, so that we're left without excuse. But that's what Joseph did, right? He used what he had, it doesn't matter big or small, to take care of the body of Christ. So we're going to go through them real quick. We're going to give you examples of how to apply them, and let's see how we can take care of the body of Christ. So first, hands. We all have hands, and we can do a lot with our hands. For example cleaning up the room, putting the chairs together, putting the wires away, setting up and tearing down. We all have hands that we can use to take care of the church. And not just this room, but this whole church. For example, in the restroom, if you see a towel on the floor, pick it up with your hand and throw it away. Treat this church as the body of Christ, which it is. And with your hands, you can also wave at someone. Just say hi. Because 
The body of Christ is not just the church and a building, it's the people, all of us who make up the body of Christ. Make people feel welcome, say hi to people, because when you do that, you're taking care of each other and building up the body of Christ. And I'm sure you can come up with more ways to use your hands for God's glory, and I pray that God gives you wisdom and opportunities to do that. Next, feet. Hands and feet, it's a blessing to have these few things. For those of you who have cars, you can use your hands and feet to drive your car. Why don't you offer someone a ride, go out for a meal, do something fun together, get to know each other more. A lot of us in here are college students. Get to know each other more. We were kind of divided over that in quarantine here. We can meet people on campus. But hey, we have college students in here. You guys are in the same life state. You guys know the struggles that you're going through. And not just college students. If you're in college, if you have a car, why don't you offer some middle schoolers or high schoolers to hang out? Make some memories. Take them out for a hike, a drink, a, a meal. I remember when I was in middle school, um, these two sisters named Lorraine who we took me and Kayla out for many adventures. And I look back and smile because they were such great memories that I made with them. And I appreciate them so much for it. So you can do the same for those who are younger than you. Just take them out for a meal, a great sandwich place. I don't know, you get the idea. If you have a car, use your hands and feet, drive that car, pick someone up, and just hang out and take care of each other. And do it as soon as possible because while you're still in college and in school, you kind of still have your own schedule. So I, I started working and I literally have to ask my boss for like time. And it's sad, like, boss, can I have two hours of my life back? Can you please have it? It's so sad to think about it that way, but that's reality. So while you're still in college, while you still have time, do something and do it with each other. Build up the community, use your hands and feet to take care of Jesus' body, us. Next, your voice. If you have a voice, you can do a lot with it. You can make announcements up here, or be the person who summarizes what the speakers talk about afterwards, or be the person who talks to the speaker when they first come. And that's a great thing. I've been doing it, and I love it because these speakers that come, they're PhD professors, pastors, people like I am, they're super smart. So actually, when you talk to them, they give you advice, they give you input for your life. And like, I grow as a person just by talking to them for five minutes. It's great if you use your voice for that. And just saying, I would love to see a middle schooler be up here to give announcements and summarize what the speaker talked about. Two reasons. One, I think it's great if you start early to serve the Lord, and it's great uh, practice public speaking, talking to people starting so young. And number two, I think it would be hilarious to see the speaker's face when they see a middle schooler summarizing when they talk about giving announcements. It shows the spiritual maturity of you. I think that would be great to serve the Lord in that way. And maybe I might approach some of you middle schoolers to actually ask you to do that. So be prepared. Prepare. Now, you can also use your voice to build up the body of Christ, to build up the community by encouraging each other. I mean, I would love to be encouraged after I speak. And I'm not fishing for compliments, but I genuinely want to hear what I did great in, or what I did do good in, like what things flew over your head when I spoke. Because when you give me feedback, you're building me up to be a better person, a better speaker. And since I'm part of the body of Christ, you're using your voice to build up the body of Christ, the church. And you can do that to one another too, to speak life and encouragement to one another. And one of the best ways to do that is to pray for people. Ask someone how they're doing, and if they're not doing so well, pray for them. And you don't need fancy sounding prayers for God to listen to you. It doesn't need to be long. It could be short and simple. I mean, Jesus didn't say long prayers. He was pretty brief and straight up. No demon, get out, and be healed. And God listened to his voice, and God listened to your voice too. To so use your voice to pray for people, and you can see a miracle happening. For example, personal story. Some of you guys know I shared with you that my hands and wrists have been hurting a lot since I started working. Because I'm always on a computer and I have two screens. I have to drag a document this way, that way. So my hands are going like this all day. And it hurts. And I'm typing all day. And it's been going on for a long time. And it gets unbearable because like, I think in the weekend I get to rest. But the pain doesn't go away. And on Monday, I have to start again. It's horrible. But one day,
day, a friend randomly called me up and asked how I was doing and we talked for a bit and I shared with her the pain I got on my hand. And she offered to pray for me and I was like, okay, why not? And I'm not making this up, but as she would pray for me, my hands started to heat up as my hands was near like a fire. Heat started coming to my hand. I didn't know what was going on. But after she finished praying for me, you know, I shook my hand to get that heat away. And I realized the pain was gone. I'm not making this up. I'm super shocked as well. I even had to hit my hand on the wall to double check that the pain was actually gone. But God heard her voice and brought healing. And she didn't even say anything fancy. Instead, actually, in fact, I mean, she prayed in a monotone voice, like, love, please hear Josh. It wasn't anything fancy or super passionate, but God heard her voice. And I stated to encourage you that you can do that too to one another. You have to speak God move. So we can use our voice to take care of the body of Christ. Announcements, encouragements, prayer, worship, you guys can do it. So that is the voice. Next, ears. We all have ears. We gotta use them to hear each other out, to listen to each other. You know, there's this saying that this world has too many mouths and too little ears. And that's a weird saying because how can this world have more mouths than ears? What a ratio is two ears and one mouth. It just means that people love to talk, 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 and you know, mostly about themselves, but we don't have enough people to listen. In fact, this is a thing I read that says our attention span is so low. Like our attention span on average is like 12 seconds. And it just means that we can't focus and listen to people when they talk. And some TikTok users, they can't watch YouTube anymore. Because videos on YouTube are longer than six seconds and they can't stay watching such a long video. All these attention spans affect our relationship to one another too. So we can't sit and genuinely look someone in the eye and hear each other's problems. And that's the problem. But did you know that by listening to another person's pain and struggle, you can actually bring healing to them. You don't have to say a single word. You don't need to give great advice. But listening is healing. When I went on a mission trip in Turkey, there was a woman from Iran who was part of our group. One day we were doing activities and we started a conversation and she began to share with me some of her hurts and struggles. And as she was doing that, I didn't know what to say because one, some of the things she was saying, I, I didn't know how to respond to. They were hurt and deep stuff. And two, I knew at that moment the best thing to do was to listen. And I was listening, all of a sudden she started crying. As she was speaking, she started crying, like fasting and stuff like that because she was able to share what she needed to share and I was there to listen for her. And that in itself was a form of healing. So I wanted to share that to you because you have no idea what you can do with just your ears. And we all have that, to listen to each other out, to love each other through our ears. And the last thing we all have is the anterior mid cingulate cortex. What's that? It's a fancy word for your butt. Just kidding, no, it's not. The anterior cortex is a part of your brain that helps you to persevere, to endure, and to overcome. And you might ask, persevere through what? Persevere through awkward situation. Because like I said before, the body of Christ is not just a building, it's one of us, every single one of us. And in order to care for one another, love one another, we're gonna have to talk to one another. And we might have to go through awkward situations, awkward silences. For example, if you begin to talk to someone you don't really talk to in this room, your conversation might drop dead. You might like, oh, I don't know what to talk about. What questions did I ask? And we just stand there and say, all right, see you guys, bye. That's the easy way out. But thank God we have the anterior mid like cortex to help us endure and persevere through those awkward situations. Because you have to sometimes linger in those moments. It's true. When I look at the dorms like Cal State Fullerton, sometimes I'm in the restroom, and the other guys from our building would come in and start talking, and we would have a conversation. Sometimes I don't know them that well, and it gets awkward. I'm like, all right, good night, bye. But I felt like every time I left the door, I felt like God told me, you should have linger more, you should have stayed more. And I should have. These were great people that I 
make connections with that can help me in the future. But sometimes I just dip out because I can't persevere. But all of us have this the cortex in our brain that helps us to persevere through awkwardness. Yeah, it's not going to be easy. Sometimes you're going to have to force yourself to talk to people. But once you cross that awkward bridge, sometimes there won't be awkwardness, but sometimes once you cross that bridge, the other side is close relationship, love, and beautiful things. There's always going to be awkward silences and situations, but those pass by. I had a friend in college when she first started college, she wanted to meet new people, but it was hard for her at first. But eventually she decided that she wanted to meet new people and she's going to make effort. So one day as she was on campus, she um, waited to go into class, she heard a voice behind her say, hi. And she got really excited because, you know, she's going to make a new friend, someone's finally talking to her. So she turned around and said, hi, back. And the person behind her said, I'm sorry, I was actually saying hi to my dog. And that's awkward. That's really awkward. That's not my favorite part of the story. My favorite part is that we actually know that person. I'm not going to tell you, but that person got over it. Awkward situation passed, and she's okay now. So that's what I wanted to say. These things we can all use for God's glory to take care of the body of Christ. And we all have them. These aren't special gifts, special talents. These are everyday, ordinary things that we can use to make a difference to take care of the church, the body of Christ. So that's the first point I'm going to make. The second thing I talked about earlier was Joseph went in the evening. He got no attention from crowds of people. Because when you take care of the body of Christ, when you serve that church, you shouldn't expect a crowd to be able to applaud you or make you yourself feel good. That shouldn't be your motivation to serve. Your motivation should be to serve God out of your love for him. You want to give back to God. So when you serve, you serve with an audience of one. Only one person in the audience to look at you, not one person to stop. You shouldn't want a large part of people to watch you serve, get applauses and all of that. I mean, it feels good to have people see the good that you're doing. That's not what Jesus called us to. You know, sometimes taking care of the body of Christ means doing things that nobody sees. For example, picking up trash. When no one is around you, or lining up the chairs when it's like out of order. These little things that you might not get applauses for, but God sees you, He will give you that reward for taking care of the body of Christ. And this includes helping people in need. You know, Jesus tells us we, when we help others, we shouldn't let our left hand know what our right hand is doing. In other words, some of those actions of helping people should be done in secret with no one else to know. No one else to tell you a good job. No one to apply you, but God sees. And God says the reward will be yours, and God will give you a good reward for giving it. So that's my point number two. When you take care of the body of Christ, you shouldn't expect the crown of people to applause you, or that shouldn't be your motivation to serve. Um, next. <clears throat> Joseph loved Jesus' body, even though it was lifeless. Now, I'm going to say a few things right now, but none of them are the judgment. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Fact number one, Mikey left our church. Mikey was basically our pastor. He preached to us every week. He was our shepherd who cared for us. Our English ministry pastor left our church. Fact number two, other people left our church. Some of the people who I thought would stay forever left. Our group got smaller. And once again, no judgment here, just stating facts. In fact, number three, our church was affected by the pandemic. How we do things, the way we meet. And some of us, we were once close to each other before the pandemic. And after the pandemic, the quarantine, we meet on Zoom and all that, we grew apart. This church, this ministry, you could say, became lifeless. Our pastor left our church, people left our church, pandemic affected our church in a way of doing things, and maybe some of our relationships, we could say, became lifeless as well. And let's be real, let me be honest, maybe that's how we feel about this church, without it feeling kind of lifeless. I mean, we don't have large gatherings that you see at other churches. You know, we don't have a full-on worship band with bass or electric guitar, all these things, none of that. 
Our church might not even have the friends and people that you get along with. You might see other churches, you know, they have a nice group, they have a nice community, the people there are funny, they make good jokes, they have a great environment. And who knows, maybe you can you know, grow there more as a person. I don't know. But one thing I know for sure is we can't just love the church, the ministry, when it's full of life, when everything is functioning well, like when a lot of people are here. And there's a pastor to lead us, and everything is set up and free. We shouldn't love the church just because it has it all together and because the church is meeting all your needs spiritually, socially. That's not the reason why we should love the church. We should love the church because it is the body of Christ. I mean, take a look at Joseph. He loved Jesus' body, even though it was lifeless, even though Jesus' body couldn't offer him anything in return, no miracles. No healing, no demon casting, none of that. But Joseph chose to love and take care of Jesus' body, wrapped it up in white linen, placed it inside of a tomb with loving care. In fact, it even costed Joseph to love Jesus' lifeless body. The Bible tells us that Joseph used his own brand new tomb to place Jesus inside. It costed him to love Jesus' body. The Bible said that when Jesus was alive, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus. He saw Jesus do many miracles, many healings, and Joseph loved Jesus when he was alive. But when Jesus died, Joseph still chose to love Jesus, even though he didn't do any miracles, no glory on his body. Dead or alive, Joseph loved Jesus' body because it was the body of Christ, because it was Jesus. And we need to do that too. We need to love the body of Christ, dead or alive, whether it's broken or perfect, glorious or lifeless. We need to love the body of Christ because it is the body of Christ. Because our church and ministry might not have those amazing things for you, might not have all the things you expect from the church, it might seem dead to you, just like Jesus' body. His body was bruised lifeless, his hands and feet have holes, and who knows, maybe our church has a bunch of holes too, things that are incomplete, things that we need to work on, things that are missing. But we need to love the body of Christ, and my question to you is, where do we do that? We love the body of Christ, even if it doesn't seem so glorious to you, and will you still love this church, even if it can't offer you much? You know, in fact, loving this church, like I said before, might even cost you, just like how it costed Joseph to use his own tomb to love Jesus' body. But he did it anyways. So will you still love the body of Christ, this church, even though it's like us? And I hope that my last point would help answer that question for you. My last point is this. Joseph prepared Jesus' body for a resurrection. He didn't just leave Jesus' body out there on its own for animals to take him away for his body. No, he chose to get Jesus' body from Pilate, wrapped it in white linen cloth, placed it inside of his tomb, his own tomb. And the crazy thing about this was he had no idea Jesus was going to rise again. He expected Jesus to stay in the tomb because that's natural. Resurrection are not natural. Dead things are supposed to stay dead. That's how nature works, but not the case with Jesus' body. Because here's the thing about Jesus' body. Even though Jesus' body in the tomb was lifeless and dead, inside of his body has resurrection power. His body was still flowing with resurrection power. It just needed to be activated by God. And same for this church. This church may seem lifeless and dead to you. But there is resurrection power flowing in this room, in the parking lot, in those classrooms, in the chapel. Because it's the body of Christ. Regardless, Jesus' body has resurrection power. It just needs to be activated by God. And the resurrection will happen. So what does that look like for us? You know, prepare Jesus' body for resurrection. Well, it's basically everything I just talked to you guys about previously. Using what you have to take care of the body of Christ. Contributing, building up the community. That's all preparing the body of Christ for a resurrection. You can also pray for this church ministry, pray for the leaders and co-workers, pray for the speaker that come. Join us at our 9 a.m. prayers. All these are building up Jesus' body and setting it up for a resurrection. You might not think or know that what you're doing 
is setting it up for resurrection. But I want to let you know that it is because just like Joseph, when he did all those things, you know, get Jesus' body from Pilate, wrap up his body, and place it in a tomb. He had no idea that he was setting up Jesus' body for resurrection. Joseph had no idea his contribution was getting ready for Jesus to rise from the grave. Because by taking care of the body of Christ, by loving Jesus' body, you are setting up the church in this ministry for a resurrection. The thing is, sometimes we have to put in effort to make a resurrection happen. You know, Joseph has to get out there, actually go to Pilate to get Jesus' body. And after that, he has to physically wrap up Jesus' body and place it inside of a tomb. Those actions put effort. And same for that, if we want to see a resurrection in this church, in this ministry, we have to put in some effort. It's going to take work, but God sees it, and he will honor that. And to end my message, I want to say this last thing. Joseph didn't know that Jesus was going to rise from the grave. But we know that he did, because the Bible tells us in history, shows us that Jesus rose from the grave. That resurrection power is inside of him. And I, and I believe, and I speak by faith, too, that the body of Christ will have a resurrection. I mean, the physical body of Christ rose from the grave back then. And I believe that the spiritual body of Christ here and now will also have a resurrection. And it doesn't mean, though, that we're going to get super big and hundreds of people come and have a full on worship band, because resurrection doesn't mean that. It could mean that, but not necessarily. Because resurrection starts here in your heart with us, with what we have. Then it spreads to those around you, to other churches, to the world. And that's biblical because that's how the disciples did it too. It first started in their hearts, their love of Jesus, their encounter with Jesus, that resurrection happened inside of them. Then they began to share God's word, preach, build churches, and then spread to the world. It all starts in our hearts here at this church. But when God sees that we are loving one another, using what we have, what he has given us, he's going to bring more. He's going to give us more. That's how it works. And what did you want that in your own heart, life, in your own hearts, to have that resurrection power? Because some of us might not even know it, but we need that. Some of our faith in God, our walk with God, have grown stale. It's the same thing again and again and again. I'm not too tired of it. God has so much more for you. Sometimes we don't know that. It reminds me of uh, last week when Pastor Chris spoke about this man who bought a ticket to a cruise ship and how he was just eating bread and crumbs in his room. He had no idea the buffet, the restaurant were all paid for by that ticket, but he chose to eat a loaf of bread. And I don't want that to be our Christian life. When we have so much more that God has for us, but we're just eating a piece of bread. And we can have so many other things. And then start with that resurrection power inside of our hearts that God is so willing to give. We just need to say yes. So I'm going to conclude now so you guys can come up for worship. Worship me. And I want to pray for you to pray that God's resurrection power would be activated in your own life, in your hearts, that it would spread to the body of Christ. So let's close our eyes and let me pray for us. Dear God, I pray for resurrection power to enter each person's heart right now. We might not know that we need it. We might not feel like we need it. Some of us might not even know what resurrection power means. But I pray and I ask for that you show us what it is. Show us our need for your resurrection power to be in us, to change our lives and bring us back to life. And God, some of us have been living lives that are far from you, that are dull, that we're slowly dying now. So Father, I pray that you activate that same resurrection power inside of us. That wasn't Jesus when he was lying inside of that tomb. I pray for that same power that rose Jesus from the grave to be activated inside of us to give our lives and hearts a resurrection. Awaken us, Lord, I pray. And I pray that with this new life, with this new resurrection that we have in us, that we may also set this church up for a resurrection. And help us to love your body, to love your church, to love this ministry, and to love one another. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's continue to pray. Let's just continue to pray right now. We're going to sow. Speak to the Lord. Ask and we can seek and we'll find God. Ask the Lord right now. Ask him, ask him. He wants to hear your voice.
real quick. First, is there anything else after this slide? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, first, um, 9 a.m. prayers is still happening on Sunday, and related to what I talked about, that is an action of setting up the body of Christ for a resurrection. Um, Nick is not here today, but I think it's cool if I share this, but 
when Nick first heard that we have 9 a.m. prayers, because he's part of the co-worker team, so he has to come, but um, he was like, man, it's so early. He always comes with a cup of coffee because he's like, he's tired. But after he started couple, coming a couple of times, he shared with us that his life and his faith began to change and grow. His prayers started getting longer. His conversations with God started getting more real. He's like, I can't explain it, but after I started coming on 9 a.m., something changed. And I want to encourage you to give it a shot too. You can never know how God might work in your life. In fact, to show up. That's it. Sometimes, I mean, I hope you pray on that, but at least show up. That's already a big act and God can move in your hearts like that. So 9 a.m. Uh, prayers are still going on Sundays. Next Friday night fellowship, we're doing the Philippians chapter two um Kahoot thing. We're having the series. We're going through the four books of Philippians, and at the end there's a big Kahoot with um, prizes for um the winner, winners, first, second, third. And next, please, Chris, um, from last week, is coming back to speak again um, next week. So he is our speaker. And with that, that's it for today. I'll pray us out with a prayer, and we can end there. So let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you once again for the Sunday. I thank you that um, we have a group that we get to meet. Father, I just pray that you help us to um, grow closer to you, to apply what we learn um, today into our everyday lives. May you bless us this week, give us strength and energy for all the things we need to do. I thank you, Lord, because you are good. In Jesus' name, amen. Cool. That's it for today. Thank you, guys.